I believe that Mormons have agreed in a premortal life to come into a state where they are demented amnesiacs, <laughs> okay? And that that is a blessing. We are supposed to be down here in an atheistic environment where faith, not sight, is, is the issue. And so on one level, um, I have great compassion for all of us uh, in, in, in that situation. Uh, and I do believe that it's a test of trust in our hearts, as I said. So that's, I come from that theological position. There are two basic points of view in this regard and dialogue I found. You, people come from a view of immediate knowing. Every human being has a basic immediate knowledge. Even though we're out of the presence of God, I'm doing Mormon speak here, everybody's got the spirit of Christ that tells them in their conscience that there is a God. And so to say there is no God, you're lying. You cannot say that. No human being can with authenticity say that. There's that view. Um, there's the other view that there is no immediate knowing, that uh, uh, all revelation is underwhelming at some level. You can always deny seeing angels. I forgot them. You know, yet we have texts where that's going to say that the Holy Ghost does not force you to believe the Holy Ghost. <laughs> it's always a question. It's a, it's a, it's a still small voice. And uh, depending on which way you go, you can see where you would go with that, uh, with that answer. If you go with the former, then you're always dealing in bad faith. For Sartre, I mean, you, you, you're not being authentic because you do know that there is a God and you're lying like Korhor, you know, in the Book of Mormon. I choose in all my dialogue to go the other route. I would call it the assumption of good faith. That if the other, whatever they say, I assume that they're giving me their honest, deep experience. I love the Book of Mormon where it says the Spirit, the Holy Ghost will witness to the truth of all things. The Holy Ghost just witnessed to me that you really don't believe in God authentically. <laughs> you see what I'm saying where you could go with that? And so you could feel that, that honesty and, and therefore you build on that relationship. Well, what does a person do that doesn't believe in God? We're actually starting a chapter of the Foundation for Interreligious Diplomacy for Secular Humanists who want to engage, not like Hitchens, <laughs> you know. Uh, they want to engage in authentic dialogue where the issue is, can you respect me? Can you find a way to believe that I could be a moral person without a God? And they want to get into that dialogue, not to tear down religion, but to, uh, to, to learn and to, to get into an honest dialogue. So that's my response. What's your thought? All right, what I have come up with in 30 seconds is <laughs> I actually think this fits in well with what I'm saying about my proposal that the process of dialogue is a lot of what we're here in mortality to do. So atheists are clearly a religious other that's alien, that challenges us. So learning to talk to them, learning to be open, learning to take that risk of like really listening to them and not saying, oh, you're clearly wrong, while holding our commitments, that tension. And also, again, with what I was saying about experiential knowledge as being a big part of what we're here about is, and that's all of us, and we're all limited by so many things, and so they're so our perspective is so narrow, and we can only escape that by talking to other people, and that means as many other angles, as many other perspectives we can talk to, that enriches our understanding of all kinds of things. So yeah, I would definitely say bring atheists into the dialogue. Well, just very quickly, Elder Porter used the word magnanimous in his remarks this morning, and I believe that Mormonism is magnanimous enough to reach out and include every person, every living person who is committed to a certain belief and engage it and, and, and speak to it. And I think that in years to come, we will see that the evolving nature of spirituality among the younger generation which was just well documented in the recent Pew survey, uh, we'll see that our, the voc our vocabulary has to change about these issues. Uh, diversity is going to proliferate in directions that move not only across denominations, but across uh, spiritual lines. Uh, lines are being blurred, and, and I think it's going to call for a new approach and a new vocabulary. It just so happens that this, at this moment, in the evolution of social discourse, especially in the United States, that, that there are some very 
keen battle lines being drawn around particular kinds of issues that the younger generation, which I teach, uh, doesn't have much traction with. And so uh, I think that Mormonism needs to be nimble and it needs to find a way to engage with non-believers, as I said. And uh, th the, the kinds of people I, I respect, like Randy and Lloyd and others, uh, find, find touch points between uh, Nietzsche and Heidegger and Mormonism in ways that couldn't be there otherwise. And so uh, I'm, I'm optimistic. The, the comment was just made uh, that the objection was not dealing with, uh, in, I would guess, in dialogue with an atheist. It's more of a political issue. Uh, if an atheist claims you don't have a, a uh, because you're a believer, you, you don't have a say in the public sphere, yeah. You would agree also, though, you'd have the same problem with, with a Buddhist that said no Christianity in the public sphere. In other words, that same political statement could be made from an ideological standpoint that was theist, right? Your, your gripe is, the public sphere, sphere ought to be open to everybody. Let's go to this section. Oh, you have something? I have one thing. There, there are three or four distinctions that need to be made before we can even get clear as to what we're talking about here. Elder Porter made an important distinction between secularism and the secular. That's very important. But there's been a conflation of the status of non-believers with public forms of secularism. And those need to be separated out because I think they're very important to, to have on the table in conversation. And that's one of the way, that's one of the things I had in mind when I said the discussion is going to evolve, it's going to get more clear, it's going to get more nuanced, and some of these things are going to be worked out over time. Mm -hmm. 